Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. In the name of Allah, God, the most merciful, the most compassionate. Assalamu alaikum. Peace be upon you to everyone. Thank you so much for inviting me to speak. Uh, and welcome to our space, uh, the MCC Mosque. Um, you're our guests, and so we have, uh, you have a number of rights over us as being our guests. Um, and I'm honored again to, to speak and to share a little bit about what we've learned through our experience in doing some youth programs. And also, I was very excited to hear about the hearing from the, the youth programs from, uh, from the Mormon community and hearing about what they've uh, experienced. Uh, because I'm very big on not reinventing the wheel. And for, for those of us who build their life and their world outlook based on scripture, we share that commonality. We differ on certain points of theological uh, points and other lifestyle customs diets, but in, for those of us who have chosen to, to use scripture and reveal scripture as our guiding force, that's a common thread, and I believe that's the work that this organization is doing to try to remind us uh, of that. I'd also like to begin by wishing everybody a happy new year. I'm not late. Uh, for the Muslims, it's our new year. It's a Muharram. We go by the lunar calendar, and so Muharram is uh, the, this month, which just started. And for us, it also signifies one of the most momentous occasions for celebration in the Muslim tradition, which is the exodus of the messenger of God, Moses, from the land of Egypt and bringing the children of Israel out of the bondage of the Pharaoh and into freedom. And so this, for us, is on the 10th day of Muharram, and so it's a day of celebration. And I think it's quite appropriate that we're having this event in that month with that occasion because Moses, if anybody was a youth leader, <laughs> Moses is at the helm of, the, of that youth leadership. And we actually, uh, in our tradition, in uh, the Muslim tradition, we read uh, the middle chapter of the Quran every Friday. And in that story is a story of Moses and his helper, who was uh, named Yusha, Joshua. And my mother actually told, took me to visit his grave uh, in Jordan, which is uh, just above the hometown of my father in, in Jordan. Um, and Joshua is known to have led the youth from amongst uh, the children of Israel in our, in our um, uh, understanding of the tra tradition. So I think it's very appropriate that, that this event, and speaking about youth leadership and youth programs in this month, um, again, I think it's really important for us to not reinvent the wheel, and so these um, occasions where we can come and share our experiences is really important. Um, and I'll mention a few points where I think that really comes out. Um, even though we have a program for Muslim youth in the mosques, um, led by Muslim youth counselors, I also encourage all of our counselors that are working in the programs to look at other programs that have been successful and to look at the programs that work and what don't work. And I think that's very important for youth leaders or youth uh, directors or anyone doing youth programming to look at what works and what doesn't work because we don't have to reinvent the wheel. Um, so just as, a, as an example, I have a, a friend of mine, a colleague, who does a lot of youth programs with the Muslims in Ohio and his daughter is one of the first Boy Scouts. Oh. You know, they've now changed it. So if you're interested in that story, you can type in Terizi, T-A-R-I-Z-I, -I, and Boy Scouts, and his daughter, 10 years old, will come up as one of the first Boy Scouts. And I think now it's Scouts, right? Um, and so we were talking about some development of coded conducts uh, for our youth programs across the U.S. and for our massages in Moscow. And he said, well, you know, we don't have to reinvent the wheel. The Boy Scouts have already dealt, dealt with a lot of uh, ethical issues, code of conduct issues, how counselors, and let's bring some of that experience, it's over a hundred years of experience, into our spaces, and that's something that he's worked on with me, and we're bringing it into to our space. Um, I also, myself, subscribe to some Christian youth newsletters, just to see what's going on, and what's working, and what's not for other communities, um, and so uh, I appreciate this opportunity to share with the other faith communities of what's been working for, for us. One of the things that has really worked for for, for myself and the programs that I do, is appreciating what each individual brings into the room. Sometimes when we're doing youth programs, we take the attitude of sage on the stage. And there's a lot of movement within the educational 
within, within education to take the, the, the idea of lecturing and that the teacher knows it all to turn it around to where it's learner-centered. And so in the same way, I think it's very important that the youth programs are youth-centered, not youth-directed, because they sometimes need the advice of the elders in the community and experience. And as I gain in years as well, I start realizing some of what my elders or what my parents had mentioned to me, and I said, oh, that's what they were talking about. You know, It's not that we got it all figured out when I was 15 or 16 and everybody else doesn't know. Um, and so I'm coming to appreciate more and more of that wisdom, but at the same time, uh, appreciating what each individual brings into the room and making, making sure that the program is about them and not just, listen, this is what we have to offer, and what they call sage on the stage, or lecture or chalk and talk in the, uh, in the educational literature, where the teacher just writes on the board and talks. And it should, it should change to where now, let's hear what you have to say. And, and I actually use this as a technique. If, if somebody asks me a question, and a lot of times they bring me questions that are, that are very sensitive in nature, and by that I mean theological issues, or what, do, what is our Muslim outlook, or what is our view? And rather than take the approach of, here, this is what it is, I'll ask them, say, well, what do you think? Not to regulate the definition of our tradition and of our faith, to their opinion, because as Muslims we don't, we believe that the understanding of the faith comes through revelation. But to see what, what it, where are you coming from? And then to mold that into um, uh, adding, maybe sticking, uh, asking questions and so forth. And so I think it's very, it's, it, it has been uh, uh, beneficial for me to use that philosophy um, in bringing into the room. And this is what I believe is also the prophetic philosophy or the prophetic method of education and, and, and programs, if, so to speak, is that the, the, the men that God sent to convey to humanity the message of God were not dictators. They built people and they built individuals and worked to form the best that that person can be. And one of the traditions narrated by the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, is that he said that people are like ores of gold and silver. The best of them before Islam is the best of them after Islam if they gain understanding. And what that means is that everybody has a core metal. And before that metal can really come to fruition, before you can take gold and put it into a semiconductor to operate some of this digital equipment that, we're, that we have or to, to use it as jewelry, you have to refine it. And so that's, the, that's also the process that the human being has to go to is to figure out what is their ore because there's different properties. Silver has properties, copper and gold. And so the person who is helping to develop the youth really has to learn to recognize what are the strengths in this individual and help develop those, those strengths. At the same time, it's not all directed by the youth. There should be, an, uh, there should be a guide or a coach. And in the Muslim tradition, this is called the murabbi or the nurturer. And it comes from the same word that the word Rabb comes from. And if I say Murabbi, what does it sound like in another language or a tradition? Rabbi. Rabbi. And it comes from, because Arabic and, and, and Hebrew are Semitic languages, they share a lot of words, um, uh, sim similarities in words and, and in structures and in roots. And so the Murabbi, the, 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 the person who does Tarbiyah, is the person who nurtures just like, and one of my teachers told me, he said, just like the bird nurtures the, the, it, its young. So when it's in its egg, when it uh, doesn't have feathers, you know, and taking the, 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 the youth through the various stages. So these murabbis that we're helping to, to, to train, the other thing is that they need training too, and they need counseling too. So for the youth counselors, the youth directors, the deputy youth uh, leaders in our, in our community, they need training too. And sometimes in the programs, what happens is it all becomes about the participants in the program. And are we making sure to get the best experience for the participant and the best program for the participant? And we forget that the facilitators, they need help and direction and support and so forth. And so making sure that the facilitators 
have just as much attention and time as the participants in the program is very important for the sustainability of the program. And that's what we found uh, here at MCC, especially in the girls program, which ha is, uh, has been going for about 10 years. The boys program that we've started, that we've modeled it after the girls program here, um, has a very strong emphasis on developing the murabbis in our communities. Uh, because at the end of the day, if a, if a, if, if, if a young person needs to reach out to somebody, they may reach out to the leader of the, that community, in our case, the imam or the sheikh of the masjid. They may reach out to their parents, but who are they mo more likely to reach out to? Yes. Friends and peers. And so if we can develop these friends and these peers to be uh, youth mentors and murabbis, then that makes a more sustainable and um, um, long-term um, program. The other thing that it does is, is that it, it helps make, make sure that it's sustainable in that the program is not centered around one person. Uh, because if that person moves away, then the program will fall apart. But if it's more organic in nature, that it's a, it's a community and you have multiple people who are emboldened and empowered and strengthened, then you can have multiple people to make sure that that tarbiyah is happening really in every portion of the center where we gather. Uh, it can happen in the hallways, which it does here. It can happen in uh, in the parking lot in those conversations. But it has to be it has to be under training and counseling. Um, another point, in addition to the morabis, is that um, and from what I've uh, seen and experienced, is the importance of including the parents. And so sometimes in in youth programs, the focus again become, becomes on the, the 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 participants. And then also the facilitators of that, meaning the people in that space, the religious space, in our case it's the, 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 the mosque, and we forget that really the biggest influence on the child's life are the parents. And so if we're not working with the parents as a team, then we're missing out on a big factor of change uh, that can happen through the parents. And then also involving the parents. And, um, in the same way when we involve the, the, the youth and we hear their voices and we say, well, what do you think about this program? Should we direct it towards this, uh, this way? We want to hear those voices from the parents. So over the summer, um, one of the parents who just came in and he, he was bringing his sons in to, uh, to, to volunteer for the program, and I was really amazed by his five boys that, that were there really helping us out in the program. And then I started talking to him. Rather than just dropping off your boys, well, would you like to uh, participate in the program? And then he did, and when he did, he brought in, I didn't even know that he had 30 years of experience in doing programs with boys and his own boys. He brought his, uh, one of his sons had memorized the Holy Quran, which is over 500 pages, and was an Eagle Scout, almost an Eagle Scout. So how did you do that? And so I asked him, and we're now incorporating some of his experience into, into the programs that we're developing here at, at, at MCC. Um, the other thing is, so in, uh, making sure that it's uh, learner-centered, that we have the murabbi component, we're including the parents, and then, and I'll kind of wrap up around this, but it's um, reaching the youth where they are. And this is something that really took me a while to, to recognize, which is, for the most part, our mosques programs, and when I say our mosques, I don't mean just MCC, but around, around the country, the programs are happening in the mosque. Well, the majority of people who really would benefit from the programs, and I should say not necessarily benefit, but need the programs the most, are not coming to the mosques. And uh, one of my mentors, um, I also do uh, outreach work in the, in the prisons. Sometimes people say, how do you work with youth and prisoners? <laughs> That's another story of how, you know, not saying there's commonalities, but I've found both callings and uh, um, people say, who do you love teaching? I said, I love teaching young children and prisoners. Okay. <laughs> um, but one of the, my mentors in, in, that, uh, in that field of work and outreach in the prisons, he, was, he, he did a, a chaplaincy uh, training, and this was for uh, the, whole, the chaplains of all the CDCR. I'm not, I don't work with uh, the Department of Corrections, but I was there at the chaplain training uh, program, and there were Native American, Protestant, Catholic, Hindu, Jewish chaplains, Muslim chaplains, all faiths were represented. And one of the things that he was really stressing to the chaplains is that he said, for the majority of, of the chaplains, your programs are happening in the chapel. He said, but the, the people who are coming to the chapel, they're the ones who are 
most likely that if they get out of prison, they're not going to recidivate. They're not going to come back to prison. They're going to take this message and keep going, keep going forward. So what he was saying is that some of those people who are in the mosque uh, or in the chapel, they can help you facilitate programs, but you as the chapel, the chaplain, should really be out there in the community and reaching the people where they are. And so I'd like to just take a moment to, to read something I found uh, from another... Um, um, this was some advice for developing Muslim youth programs. And so this person, after speaking with a lot of uh, people who, who do youth programs, said that we can, we can categorize the, the youth into three groups. And I'm going to read the descriptions of each of these groups, and it's talking about the Muslim groups, but just enter, um, um, add in whatever you know, uh, name for your youth leader or your pastor or your imam or your, or, sorry, your, um, your um, religious representative. So the three groups are religious youth, mostly religious youth, and not so religious youth. He said, for the religious youth, these are your MSA going, Muslim Student Association, the, the clubs in the school. MSA going, weekend seminar attending, Sheikh so-and-so rocks. Are there anybody in your community, you know, pastor so-and-so rocks? <laughs> do, do you have youth like that? Yeah. That are really uh, gung-ho. Sheikh so-and-so rocks, the type of brothers and sisters, you know who they are. They, are. they keep on gaining knowledge, want to go study overseas, attend college, high school at the same time. They're active in, in uh, missionary work. They're recognized in their community. They teach at Sunday school. They conduct weekly lessons in their mosque. They truly care about the communities. They are the rising leaders of the Muslim youth. The mostly religious youth, these are the youth... Um, these are the youth the religious crew needs to focus on. Who are they? They come to the mosque for the Friday prayer, the Friday night youth group, Islamic events. At the same time, they miss, may listen to Lady Gaga, could find something be, uh, better, friends to hang out, and may even let a few curse words fly him here and there while they are with their friends. They have a relationship with the religious youth and with the third category, who we will be talking about next, the non-religious youth. The religious youth need to understand that these are the people who they need to work with and build a rock-solid relationship with. They are the most effective route to getting across to the non-religious Muslim youth. The not-so-religious youth, these youth have a bit of a long road ahead of them. They may not have come to the masjid except on Fridays when their parents bring them. They may also not be involved in the mosque, in the MSA, or even pray regularly. They have girlfriends, boyfriends, do drugs, alcohol, and also do not hang out with a healthy group of friends. The middlemen youth are really the only group to have a grip on these guys. They are the ones who, the, uh, the, the, that can bring the not-so-Islamic youth towards the tour of the mosque into activities planned by the religious youth. And so what he was showing, or the author was showing in this article, is that a lot of our programs are really directed towards religious youth in the mosque space, and they're, they're coming into the mosque. Whereas, how are we reaching the people who don't even want to step into our space? And so this is something that I've used to try to uh, they do outreach in our community, work with the MSAs in the high schools, help uh, uh, train, uh, train them to, to, to bridge that gap um, into, with, with, with the third, uh, third group. Um, and it's still, our programs are always uh, developing. The last thing, and I think I'll, I'll end on this, um, I think, is my time up? Uh, 20 minutes? No, you have about... Uh about three more minutes. Okay. Um, my mom always tells me, Rami, you need to stop, stop talking so fast and smile more. So I hope I'm smiling more and I'm not talking as fast as I usually do. Um, so the last thing I will say is that um, one thing that we've uh, found that uh, is, uh, has become more and more uh, a request of the youth themselves to have programs that are about are about uh, programs for um, uh, addressing the mental health component and mental health status of our communities. In fact, just this past weekend, there was a youth focus group and they were developing their own uh, youth committee. Um, and the first thing they asked each other, they said, okay, what, kind of, well, what, more, what type of programs do we want to see for the youth? Um, rather than adults saying, okay, we're going to have this program, this program, this program, what are the youth, what are you saying you would like to see? And the first hand was more programs for the youth addressing mental health concerns in our community. Um, and that, you know, the whole range of that, um, and including suicide awareness, and bringing those discussions, removing stigma around those discussions, um, uh, uh, groups around, just today I was speaking with a parent 
who, who specifically asked, she said, can we have in MCC, can we have programs, youth support groups for mental health and dealing with addiction issues? These are issues that these are human need to have those discussions in our, in our mosques if we can. The last thing I will say is, and I'll end on this, is that uh, on this story, I was uh, taking a flight and there was a young evangelical pastor and his wife, they were sitting next to me. We started uh, talking. My wife always says, well, you can talk with anybody. I enjoy talking to people. I'll talk with the toll booth attendant. I ask them for discounts, and that gets them you know, out of the robot mode. Say, any discounts today? No. Any coupons? Um, so the young evangelical pastor, he was on a way to some uh, missionary and relief work that he was doing in Thailand, and we got to talking. And so we got to the point of saying, you know, I think we each have misconceptions about each other's community and faith. Let's use this plane to talk about that. And so he asked me some questions about Islam and, and understanding. And I said, you know, and to be honest, I'll be totally honest. I know Muslims are very misunderstood, but in our communities, the Muslims, I think we misunderstand the evangelical community, especially because of all of the rhetoric in the news about who are the evangelical communities. And, I, and no one group or religion is monolithic in nature. And so we have to speak to the individuals. So after we, we exchanged some ideas, and we're still in contact, we, have, we email from, from time to time, I said, you know, I think one thing that we can do is, um, and this is a call, uh, Allah, God mentions this in the Quran, it says, speak to the people, to the people of faith, the Christians, in this scenario where the scripture was, was revealed to, and say, can we come together on a common word? And so this common word is, we have to look for what are those commonalities be to, uh, amongst us. And I think the common word that we can come to with, within our various faith communities is that there is a push within modern society right now to discount religion and to even mock religion. And there's no faith that agrees that we can mock another, uh, our own religion, another's religion, another uh, person, uh, another person's faith, their scripture, what they worship, who they worship, we cannot mock them. And this is happening, at the, uh, the, this mockery of religion is happening in the cartoons, it's happening in social media, it's happening in media, and the late night talk shows, and just a really a mockery of religion and a disrespect of religion, and a push for people to move away from religion, and, and a push towards atheism. And so I said, you know, I think one thing that we can agree on is we both believe in God. And one thing that our youth and our communities and the members of our communities struggle with is this push towards is there a God or is there not a God? And that's something that we can work together on to help each other's community and say, look, we do have theological differences amongst our various faiths, but we can agree on certain things, and let's have conversations around those, in addition to having healthy dialogues about uh, differences that we may have. So I'll end there. I apologize if I went over my time limit, um, and I look forward to uh, hearing from uh, Scott Adam about, um, uh, about what they've experienced in their community. Oh. We have five minutes for questions, if okay. you have the time. Yes, yes. Okay. Nice. Anybody have some questions? One question. Mm -hmm. Since your religious prayers are on Friday, and Friday in the U.S. happens to be a one day, right. how do you handle it? Well, that's a very good question. And um, it's very difficult. Munir handles a lot of the difficulties here with the parking because we have um, uh, people who come on their lunch breaks and we have, so they, a lot of people will use their lunch breaks. Some people will actually design their lives around that and so I think one of the, the benefits of, of living in, in the area where you have a lot of tech workers is that there is the ability to work from home and so we do find a lot of community members who will work from home on Fridays or work half a day to make it to the Friday prayers. There's also a lot of com companies that offer the Friday prayers at the at the company, Facebook, Google, uh, Cisco, a lot of the big companies. They even have rooms dedicated for prayer rooms and for the Friday prayers. Um, I think one of the the so people who work they, they work around it. They take their lunch breaks and uh, or, or or have their prayers there at the at their place of work. Um, take half days. Really, where it becomes difficult is with the youth in high schools, um, where they want to pray. And there's sometimes there's some constraints. MCC has been very uh, accommodating to the local high schools in that they actually have three Friday prayers. So normally they'll have just one service, uh, but as the congregation grew, a lot of mosques added a second uh, Friday prayer. MCC uh, took an initiative and added a third Friday prayer that actually is after school and a lot of times led by some of the youth of the community, and so that allows them to have the, the Friday prayers here. I've also worked with people in the... Uh, in their high schools to help them facilitate Friday prayers in the actual high schools. 
I have a question. Yes. Do you need an email to have a prayer session? Oh, very good question. Do you need an email to have a prayer session? And one of the things um, that uh, one of uh, you know, and, I, and I, I'm actually looking forward to hearing um, uh, from about the Mormon community and their programs because one big difference between the Muslim community and I think the Mormon church from the way I understand it is that the Mormon church is very centralized um, and the Muslim community is not. So there's some, there's some benefits and drawbacks to not having a centralized community um, and in, in terms of what messages are, are delivered on the Friday prayers and how, how, they get, how messages get delivered to the communities. Uh, especially in times when it's very critical and sensitive in terms of the topic. Uh, but one of the, the, the benefits is that you can have pretty much anybody can lead a prayer. And so we help train. We actually had a, a chutzpah training, which is the lecture um, training for the high schoolers. And so we have the high schoolers. They can lead the prayer themselves. So you don't necessarily need an imam who's trained. As long as a person knows the rules of the prayer and how, what, how to deliver the sermon, they can, they can deliver it. Other questions? What is the difference between an imam and a sheikh? Oh, uh, good, good question. What is the difference between an imam and a sheikh? Um, the, the sheikh or the sheikh in Arabic linguistically means old man. And so it just became, it's not, there's no, it's not a specific, um, um, it, it's just, it became, it became customary that the, the elder, it literally means elder. So sheikh means elder. Um, and the title, even though linguistically was only given to a person 60 years and above, once uh, uh, the, the Muslim community inherited that, the, used that, that, that word, they used it for anybody that has the wisdom of the elders, basically anybody who's studied. So you might find somebody who's 20 years old and they refer to him as sheikh. So the, the, the closest equivalent would be teacher. So it's the same as saying teacher. Um, imam just literally means the person in front. And so because in our prayer it's, you know, it's multiple lines and it's one person at the front, the imam is, the, is, the, is that one person in front that leads the congregation. Are they trained or no? And yes, the imam has to be trained, yes. And, and the sheikh, and to, to gain the title uh, of sheikh, the person would have had to have studied. Any, any insight you can give Muslim or Islamic religion picked Friday for the prayers. Oh. Most others had picked Sunday. Right. Any history to that? Oh, that's a very good question. Uh, uh, some of the, maybe the wisdom of why Friday was chosen as a day? I don't know. That's a very good question. I mean, I in, in Jordan, when I, when I grew up there, we had, um, because there, 10% of Jordan's population is Christian, and so our weekend was Friday and Sunday. And so, and Saturday was, was, was a school day. Yes. And for the Jewish population. It's Saturday. It's Saturday. Yeah. Yeah. Who knows why? Right. <laughs> okay, we'll take one more question. Yes. Are your uh, youth leaders or counselors, I, I'm sorry, I can't pronounce the word that you say, Sheikh? Sounded like rabbi. Oh, uh, Murabi. Are they volunteers taken from the community, or are they paid? It, very good question. And that's what, one of the the question was: Are the Murabis or the counselors, the youth counselors, are they volunteers or paid? Um, the girls program, which has 10, 10 years of uh, of running here at the at the MCC, they completely run on on volunteers. And one of the ways that they were able to do that is that since they started 10 years ago, somebody who started when they were 10 years old is now a 20-year-old college student, and so they're giving back. And so they run uh, a lot on, uh, on volunteers. We tried that with the boys. It worked easier to pay them hourly, <laughs> <laughs> to have them commit. The girls were able to commit as volunteers. The boys, <laughs> Thank you so much. You're welcome. Thank you. Thanks so much to uh, everyone here at the MCC for being the hosts and uh, appreciate getting the perspective from Romy and Munir and I corresponded a little bit via email just to dispel any myths. Um, even though my name is Scott Adams, I'm not the cartoonist Scott Adams that, that writes Gilbert. Um, but I do have a book signed from him that says to Scott Adams from Scott Adams. <laughs> Uh, so, uh, as been said, uh, the official name of our church is the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. Um, we go by some nicknames, the Mormon Church or the LDS Church, which stands for Latter-day Saints, um, because the, the, the name of the church is pretty long, as you, as you see. Uh, and, and our church doesn't really have a paid ministry, so uh, literally the saying, it takes a village. Um, uh, we, we rely on lots of brothers and sisters in various types of what we call callings or assignments uh, to shepherd our youth. Um, and so my wife, Kathy, just raise your hand there, Kathy. Beautiful wife there. 
Um, she, uh, Kathy and I um, have, throughout uh, many years, um, we've lived in Livermore for about 22 years now. We've served in a variety of different capacities over those years, uh, a lot of times with the youth. Um, so my wife Kathy has served as a primary president, which that's the age of our children. We have a nursery that goes up to age a uh, year and a half, and then a year and a half to 11, that's what we call our primary program. And, and so she was a, a president. Now, when we say president, it's not like the political term president, right? A, a president means preside. And so it's a servant leader, basically. You preside and show compassion and love and shepherd the youth. That's what a president, we have lots of titles of president in our church. And so as a primary president, she would have a couple of counselors and, um, and they would preside over that group of several teachers that would teach the uh, instruction on Sunday as well as um, music time and, and all sorts of things. Um, in addition, Kathy and I served as what we call seminary teachers. So our, the, our teenage youth, um, they get up early in the morning. In Livermore, uh, they have a service that starts at 6.40 in the morning. that lasts about 45 minutes. Uh, and it's to study scripture every single day of the school year. Okay, Monday through Friday, every single day. Or early, we call it early morning seminary. Right? Um, so Kathy and I were team teachers in that for a couple of years as well and really enjoyed teaching the youth, right? Um, and I agree what uh, Romy said, what, um, we, we have a very, very similar philosophy in our church. It's not the, the sage on the stage. We kind of also refer to it as the guide from the side, right? We want the youth to be engaged. We want the youth to teach. We have Sunday lessons where, where we want them to actually present lessons and um, clearly under the guidance of the leaders, as Romy has mentioned, um, but, but have them experience it, have them lead activities, have them uh, really have it come from them, because that's where they get the deep conviction, right? Um, so we, we also have, uh, in addition to the, the younger children, we have a youth group that starts from age 12 to 18. Um, and Kathy and I have both served in, in various capacities of there. We have presidencies. Uh, of sisters that preside over the young women and brothers that preside over the young men. Um, so you have a president, again, a servant leader that has a couple of counselors that help shepherd that group. Um, within, the, within those presidencies, um, Kathy and I have served as presidents and counselors in, in those capacities. I've served as a scoutmaster, um, running around camping with the, the scouts and, and really enjoyed that. Uh, our son achieved the rank of Eagle Scout. And we have two daughters that went to uh, what we call a girls camp program that um, is basically a six year program and it gets progressively difficult uh, each year with different activities and hikes. And, and I still lead an overnight hike um, uh, up in the high Sierras that's with backpacks and everything, teaching the young girls how to camp and use camp stoves and use backpacks and all of that. Um, so that's a, kind of a a fun thing as well. You know, we do other high adventure things, whitewater rafting and, and some of those things. A lot of things involved in scouting and then this young women's camp program. Uh, so currently I, I've served previously in Collins as bishop. A bishop is a person that presides over a congregation, but one of their main focuses is the youth. They have a, uh, a youth committee that meets uh, once a month with uh, other, um, other youth leaders that help uh, plan the activities for the year. And they have a monthly calendar and an annual calendar and they say, what are we gonna do to, uh, to do a variety of things? Um, so currently my calling is a little confusing because uh, in, we have several wards within what we call a state. So several wards or several congregations. So in Livermore, where, where I'm from, uh, we have six congregations. One of them is a Spanish congregation and one of them is a young single adult congregation. So the ages of 18 and 30, where they meet together. Um, and uh, provide a lot of their own leadership and, and teaching of classes, etc. cetera. Um, and then over all those wards, there's a, what we call a state president. The state president in our congregation, in our state, is President Witt, and then he has two counselors or assistants, and I'm one of those counselors. Um, so that's, that's kind of a little bit about the church. Um, to summarize kind of our, our youth program, what we try and focus on, this is not out of any book, this is just me kind of reflecting what are some of the key areas we try and focus with our youth? So uh, again, this is you're not going to find this written anywhere. This is just in Scott Adams' head here. But uh, I, I kind of pulled out six the six S's. Okay, the six S's are 
our standards. We believe in setting standards for the youth to follow. Uh, scriptures, um, as the Muslim faith uh, and many other faiths uh, have scriptures that are very important to them, and I'll talk a little bit more about that. Spiritual, as for spiritual. Social, the, the youth clearly enjoy socializing with one another. Service, uh, service is a fundamental um, a component of, of most religions, right? And, and sacrifice. And so I'll talk a little bit more in my remaining time about each of those. Standards, uh, I brought uh, over on the, uh, the side um, board over here, I, I brought some different booklets uh, that you're all welcome to take with you. Um, one, we actually start uh, with our younger children. Uh, our, our children in the age of, uh, at the age of eight, they're baptized. And so that we have a Faith in God booklet for young men, or for girls, and one for boys. And in here, there are different standards that, um, that talk about prayer, reading scriptures, keeping commandments, all sorts of different things. And they set goals at a young age. Uh, and then they, they actually win a little award uh, for completing um, those, those little activities. So, and, and they would get that award probably somewhere in the, in the range of um, about 10 or 11 years old when they complete these little booklets. Then they graduate to the youth program, and there are uh, two programs. One is called Duty to God for the Young Men and Personal Progress for the Young Women. And uh, they're separate programs uh, involved with lots of different activities that they need to, to do involving parents and leaders. Um, the, uh, just to give you an idea of some of the standards, for example, for the young women, um, the young women, they have, they have several values that they focus on, and they do projects within each one of these values. Um, the values are faith, divine nature, individual worth, knowledge, choice and accountability, good works, integrity, and virtue. So those are just an, an example. That the the uh, duty to God um, has similar things, and we also have done a lot with scouting, so the scout oaths, the scout law, uh, all of those things tie right back into a lot of the things that we believe in, in duty to God, country, and, and our fellow men, right? So that's standards. Uh, scriptures, we actually have what we call four standard works. We believe in the Bible, both the Old and the New Testament. We have a separate book called the Book of Mormon, and I could spend a half an hour talking about that, but I, I don't have the time tonight. Um, and then we have the Doctrine and, Covenant, Doctrine and Covenants and then the Pearl of Great Price. Um, and in the uh, seminary program that my wife and I taught the, for the early morning seminary students, every year, it's a four-year program, and you rotate. So one year, the, the whole focus is on the Old Testament. The next year, uh, New Testament. Next year, Book of Mormon. And then the final year, Doctrine and Covenants and Church History. And it just rotates. So our, our, our youth get very involved in, and, and part of the requirements of that course is you have to read um, the entire New Testament, um, the Old, Old Testament's a little longer, so it's a lot of selections from the Old Testament, but quite a bit of that, that book as well. Um, so that's a little bit about scriptures. Let's talk about spiritual experiences. Uh, we, we have um, a lot of what we call youth conferences, where we have special speakers, um, sometimes really interesting speakers that have had interesting experiences in their life. And a lot of times we, we unite with other groups. So here in the Tri-Valley, we have what we call a stake in Livermore, Pleasanton, and Danville. Sometimes the, uh, the, root, the youth from each of those stakes will get together for either dances or, or youth conferences, um, lots of different types of things. Music is very important in our church. We have uh, a lot of musical numbers that the kids <coughs> learn from, um, the, from a young age. Uh, one of them that most of them memorize is called, I am a child of God, and that's very important. We do a lot of family history. We believe that the whole um, human family is connected, um, and so we, we do lots of family history. We have a family history center in, in Livermore where you can research your ancestors and the youth, uh, because they're more high-tech than some of the rest of us, uh, are very involved in, in that family history work. Um, and a lot of it's uh, looking at, at records and, and, and inputting that into the computer. We have a lot of online tools, um, websites, videos, podcasts. Um, I talked about youth teaching classes to other youth. Uh, we actually have a world, we have a satellite system that connects um, typically one of our churches in, in each one of our cities. And uh, through those, uh, the, the headquarters of our church is in Salt Lake City, Utah. Uh, we have a, a prophet uh, there. His, uh, we just had a new prophet uh, within the last year. Uh, his name is um, 
Russell M. Nelson, and uh, he used to be a heart surgeon in his career, and, uh, and then has been serving in the church for many, many years. He's 93 years old. He um, uh, had a broadcast, uh, because we're a worldwide church, uh, with all the satellite system where people could ask questions via satellite, and uh, he, he put out uh, some challenges. Uh, he asked the youth to go on a seven-day social media fast. Now, we believe in fasting in our church, similar to the Muslim faith, um, from food and, and, and water and those things. But he said, stay off social media for a week and just see how that impacts your spirit, right? And so they took on that challenge, right? So that's, that's another thing that we do. Uh, social experiences is, is the other S. Um, mutual... Um, we have mutual activities, which is a weekly, typically on a Tuesday or Wednesday night, where the youth get together and have social activities. Sometimes it's a service activity um, where they're out helping uh, somebody in need, uh, or they're, uh, I'll, I'll get into that in my service um, section. But, um, but, but they have, uh, we have uh, dance festivals. If you've been in our churches, we have kind of a gymnasium as well as a, a theater um, stage. Uh, and so we do what we call road shows or, or, or um, little theatrical plays that the youth get involved in, and, uh, and then we do um, dance festivals where they learn different dances and, and perform those as well. Um, let's see. We talked about scout camp and girls camp, and the service to your fellow men is extremely important. Um, and uh, we also get involved in community events, the Open Heart Kitchen, um, which many of us get involved in, in, in from a variety of religions. Um, and help in that effort. There's a backpack project that uh, the Interfaith gets, the group gets involved in that help with backpacks for kids in need. There's a city community day of service that we get all our kids from age three and maybe even younger out there pulling weeds or spreading bark or, or doing whatever, whatever they can. And then my last topic is, is sacrifice. I, I mentioned seminary, uh, so can you imagine it was kind of my job to wake up my kids. So my wife, Kathy, and I have three kids. They're, they're all retired teenagers now, so they're in their 20s. Uh, and two of them have kids of their own. Uh, we have five grand grandchildren. We only had three, and we had two, two more um, as of last month. So uh, the family is growing. But um, but can you imagine getting teenagers out of bed just for regular school, now try 6, 6.40 in the morning, right? So to be there by 6.40 in the morning, right? Now, luckily, our churches are a lot of times pretty close to our high schools and so they can hopefully um, once they once they leave the religious service that morning they can go over to the high school but it's a, it's a really good start to their day to pray sing hymns study the scriptures um, before they go into what the crazy life of high school is like if you if I need to remind anyone sometimes it can be pretty pretty crazy out there and a lot of bullying and, and um, intolerance and, and other things and so we want to prepare our youth in a strong spiritual manner every day before they go to high school. Um, part of the sacrifice, we have uh, church universities um, and educational systems. Uh, the main university is, is uh, Brigham Young University in Utah. There's a, uh, an Idaho campus and a Hawaii campus as well. Uh, and then we sponsor other um, types of um, uh, programs. There's actually an online degree program that is worldwide now that we're helping those for a fraction of a cost get a college degree, and so that's a worldwide program. Um, missionaries, you, many of you have associated our church with missionaries, uh, and so at the age of 18, a young man can go on a two-year mission. Uh, they put in an application, and they get called anywhere in the world. Uh, young women at the age of 19 uh, can also serve, and they serve for uh, 18 months. And then people in, older in life, couples can, can serve as missionaries, and, and we have proselyting missionaries, we have humanitarian missionaries that, that go all over the world helping with whether it's a well system for drinking water or all sorts of things, right? Um, but the missionary the missionary service, I think my time's running out, right? The missionary service is, um, uh, I, I served my mission in Spain for two years, um, and uh, it's at an early age you're learning how to focus outward, which is what we want our youth to do. Not be so focused about yourself, but how you respect and treat other people and care for them and serve them. I learned at age 19 how to help people overcome addictions and how to treat people with respect and learn different cultures and all those things. And uh, that 
that is something that I think is, is something that sticks with our youth for, for their entire life, right? It sets them up in a foundation as they go into their work life and career uh, of focusing outward and loving others. Um, one last quote I'll, I'll say from my, uh, our, our um, president, President Witt, um, that presides over our state, uh, that I support as one of his assistants or counselors. Um, he, he likes to talk about friends and, and the importance of connecting our youth with good friends and being a good influence on each other. And he, he likes to say, um, friends are like elevators. They either take you up or take you down. And, and so he's always encouraging the youth to find, push the right button, get the right friend, and, and take you up. And, and if it's a friend that's taking you down, get off the elevator. So that'll open it up to questions. Okay, yes, questions for Scott. I actually have questions. Yes. Um, hey, oh, what do you? What would what would we call you, elder? Or? Uh, yeah, my title is elder um, in the. Well, I, I've had the title of elder in the priesthood. The title is bishop. Uh, my current title is president because the three of us, as, as a group, we preside over a group of congregations. So. So like, it's President Adams, but you can call Scott. <laughs> <laughs> um, my manager, actually, um, my last job was named Scott, and he was Mormon, and he was a great manager, and I think he was really um, part related to his faith. Um, he, was, he was amazing. But anyway, sorry. Um, so I had three questions. Okay. So first of all, like, what do you feel is like the actual percentage of the youth that you guys are able to engage with in your activities? Like you listed off a whole bunch of activities. But did you, do you feel like it's the same kids coming over and over, like the same kids, or is it actually are you able to kind of reach out and engage like the wide range of kids? That's a great question. Uh, you know, we uh, some kids are into camping and scouts, and others are not, um, and so that's the purpose of this youth council that meets every literally every congregation has a, a youth council that meets with their bishop on a monthly basis, and so they may say, hey, you know. Uh, we didn't see Bobby and Sally and, and all these folks last month because they didn't like that activity. How about if we do this activity? And so we involve the youth in planning so that they can outreach. And we try and get them to invite their friends. Um, uh, do, we, do, we do we get 100% attendance every time? Absolutely not, right? And, and are there youth that we're concerned about with some of the problems? We mentioned depression and anxiety and some of these rising things that are pl plaguing our youth. Uh, we have all sorts of outreach programs for those as well. Um, but we're constantly looking to, to, to get as many people as we can and, and to, to appeal to, to them and, and bring them uh, and, and get them to, to be better and help others. Mm -hmm. That's a great idea, like engaging the youth and having different types of activities. So um, regarding your daily morning study that you had, what age did that start at and how did you motivate the kids, like your kids, and was it a group of kids? Yeah, so it's, it's all across the church, all across the world, age 14 to 18, so high school age. Uh, we want them as they're a freshman in high school to, to go have this um, religious instruction. And it really helps prepare them to be missionaries as well. As a matter of fact, some countries, like Brazil, they require some kind of a ministerial certificate. And if you there's a graduation program where you have to meet all these requirements to graduate, and then they get that certificate of, of seminary. So, uh, did I answer your question? So, and then they would have to actually be somewhere else outside of the house at six forty. Or is that oh yeah, they actually come to the church. There are so in Livermore we have two church buildings and we have five different classrooms based on age. So sometimes there's a freshman class, a junior class, a sophomore, senior. Um, sometimes that we combine a couple of age groups based on how many people are coming. But we have so we have five different teachers in Livermore teaching different classes every morning at school's in session. Mm -hmm. And that's common throughout our church throughout the world. Mm -hmm. uh, and I have one question. Uh, so, excuse me. Sorry, one more question. So, well, <laughs> we, um, I have a problem. Um, we are starting to run out of time. And we want to, to give everybody a chance to get a snack and then come back and, and do a discussion. So I was, I'm, Scott, would you be willing to stay afterwards for oh, a minute? Sure. So maybe you could take the last question and give it to Scott afterwards so that we can get another person or two to ask 
one question. Is that right? Sure, sure. Okay. Yes. Is the mission experience required when the child is 18, 19, different ages for men and women, you said? Very good question. We we strongly encourage our young men to go. We, we, we say we really want you to go, and at the end of the day, everyone has their free will, right? Okay. And and uh, and so there's some that choose not to go, but we strongly encourage our young men to go. Our our young women, uh, it's more of a volunteer basis. Uh, recently, the the age was changed from 21 for young women to, to 19, and we had a huge influx of, of what we call our sister missionaries, our young young missionaries, uh, go out into the world. And so uh, so it's a voluntary thing, but but many 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 more of the young women are going there and, and really enjoying. That, that experience. Thank okay. you. Okay, let's have one Can more I, uh, question. One then... quick question. Yes. Your experience, once the case go from youth to term you use part, adult is the teenagers, which is we call enter into puberty. Right. What percent they lose interest in religion? What percent lose interest in religion? Uh, I would say a common statistic would be about 80% of our youth um, are are engaged up until 12, and then and then there is a drop off. It's probably about two thirds after that that, that remain interested. So about 66%. Um, so there is there is a drop off, right? And and again, we um, there, we have a whole other topic on the, what we call our plan of salvation. Um, to the, that allows all of us in, in this room and in the world to return to our, our God. We, we, we believe that our, we are children of God, everyone. We're all brothers and sisters, right? And we all have a God that loves us, and we all have the right to return. Um, but at the end of the day, everyone has a choice, right? And so um, are there certain youth that, that don't want to stay engaged? Yes. And what's our advice? Love them. Pray for them. Continue to help guide them. Unconditional love is, and who knows? Years later, they may return or they may not. But you never stop loving them. They do after fifteen. <laughs> <laughs> well, <laughs> thank you very, very much, Scott.